Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, Encompass Live is the Library Commission's weekly online event. We cover commission activities and any topics that may be of interest to Nebraska librarians. We have guest speakers that come in sometimes and we sometimes have a uh, Library Commission our own staff as we do today. Um, we do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. They're free. They last for an hour. They are recorded, so if you are unable to attend a live session, you can listen to a recording. Um, or if you have um, people who you know who might have wanted to hear the session, pass them on the info and they can listen to the recording. Um, so I'm going to hand over control now to our speaker today. We have Catherine Brockmeyer from here at the Library Commission, who's going to do our second part in a three-part series about conducting surveys. Good morning, Krista, and good welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, just want you to know that this is going to be a whirlwind tour of conducting surveys, especially data collection. And uh, hopefully you received the notes page that I sent out yesterday so that you can take some notes along the way. Um, this uh, this uh, PowerPoint presentation and all all of the information that we go over today will be available afterward once this is archived. Mm -hmm. And so you can go back and refer to it. Um, I talk pretty fast, so I hope you can hang in there. I'll try to keep it to under an hour. It may go over a little bit. And if you need to leave, I, I totally understand. But um, I'll, I'll go through this information as fast as I can. And um, hope hopefully you can keep up. If you have any questions, again, just type it in the question box. And Krista will We'll try to stop periodically, and Krista will let me know if there are any questions. Sure. Yep. Uh, my name is Catherine Brockmeyer. I'm a research analyst and special projects associate here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Two of my main um, duties include grant writing and doing evaluations. There's my contact information. If you'd like to contact me with any further questions, I'd be happy to consult um, and follow up with you on any topics regarding survey research and survey conducting surveys that you might have. And who might you be? Um, you might be a library director, a trustee, or a friends and foundation board member. Um, I also see that we may have some others from, uh, I think there was one from a hospital and so, in Nebraska. And um, if, if you do know somebody who'd like to know a little bit more about surveys, you could certainly recommend it to them. And what are your credentials? Well, the fact that you want to navigate through conducting a survey and that you have courage. <laughs> um, you may have been asked to conduct a survey and don't know anything about it um, and so you're just getting your feet wet. I'll try my best to, sh to go through um, this information today in layman's terms. I do have a background in survey research and so sometimes my terminology can get a bit technical but we will, um, we will plow through together. And who are you? Um, as you can see, we've got people from Nebraska, Pennsylvania, Wyoming, Washington, Kentucky, Virginia, Vermont, Georgia, Texas, North Carolina, Nevada, and Kansas today. So welcome, everyone. Good to have you on board. Um, aren't webinars great? This is the, the best way to get information when you can't make it to a face-to-face -face conference. I want to recap a little bit about the first um, in the series of conducting surveys. Um, I did go over reasons for conducting a survey. Perhaps you're doing an evaluation. You might be getting ready to uh, uh, look into by uh, pr um, constructing a new library. Um, you might be doing program evaluation or your board may be asking for more information. Um, you may be getting ready for an annual report. That's another reason. Um, issues in effective questionnaire design, data collection and analysis, and reporting. I did go over some of those. Um, and, I, and then the questionnaire design, especially measurement, content, and structure. We're going to look at a sample survey today, but we're going to concentrate on the formatting of the survey, not the questions themselves. So if you're looking for a question bank, that is um, available um, in this first of the uh, three-part series. We're in part two today. And that recording is available out on the website, um, our website, too. And I give you a um, link at the end of this for the recording presentation. The cool. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what are we going to go over today? We're going to talk about sampling, how to target your respondents, and survey methods. So let's jump right in. Um, what is a sample? A sample is a subset of individuals within a population of interest. 
And sampling, I'm kind of reading from this, but sampling is the act, process, or technique of selecting a suitable sample or a representative part of a population for the purpose of determining parameters or characteristics of the whole population. That's a whole mouthful. <laughs> Basically, what you're trying to do is select a smaller group from the, uh, the entire, um, your entire target audience. And what is the goal of sampling? It's to be able to make inferences to the population in question. In other words, uh, if you want to know um, some things about your pa patrons and you have your entire population of patrons, you sample a subset um, and depending on how you sample and how extensive your survey is and your investigation is, you may be able to um, make some decisions based off of the responses from this smaller subset and um, generalize to your entire population. I do caution you, however, to um, take everything, every um, your responses and the data that you collect with a grain of salt, um, con you know, considering how um, rigorous your survey is and your investigation. And why would you sample as opposed to survey everyone? Well, it doesn't cost as much money because you're going with a smaller number of people and you can collect it a lot faster because you're not trying to, to um, recruit everyone to do your survey. And what's the sampling process? We're going to go through this in detail. You define the population of concern. You specify a sampling frame, which I will define here for you in a second. You specify the sampling method. You determine your sample size. In other words, how many people you're um, going to try to collect information from. You implement the plan. You do the sampling. And then you collect your data. And then um, at the end, you, sh you ought to look at how it went for you. And so first you define your population. And the definition of a population is the entire universe of individuals who have a characteristic of interest. For example, you want your population might be patrons. Your population might be non-users. Your population might be people who attend programs. And um, here are some other examples. Residents of your city, residents of your county, uh, your library card holders, your users, in other words, your active library card card holders, your non-users, people who come to your library, people who use your computer lab, or people who attend your programs. And that's your entire population. So you can see it's quite general. Uh, the sampling frame, um, this is, a sampling frame has the property that we can identify and we can include in our sample. Um, it's it's the, the framework for um, collecting your, or for targeting your respondents. So you might use a telephone directory, a city directory, your patron database, attendance sheets, um, voter registration list, utility bill receipts, recipients, um, newspaper readers, or random digit dialing, which is um, when um, you, you go with a, a, a larger firm who can provide you with random phone numbers based off of the prefixes that are in your city. So for example, um, we might be able to get random phone numbers that start with, in, in um, Lincoln, it's 471, 488, 486, and then they, and then they randomly select the four last digits um, behind that, and you receive a, a bank of phone numbers. Some of them may not be any good, um, but that's, um, you, you receive an entire uh, list of randomly selected telephone numbers, and that would be for a telephone survey. Sampling methods. There are two kinds of sampling methods, probability sampling and non-probability sampling. When you really get into survey research um, to get the best, uh, the best results, you go with probability sampling. Every individual has an equal chance of being selected. However, um, it doesn't always work that way for us at the level that we're conducting um, surveys. And so we might go with non-probability sampling, which is that some units in the population don't have any chance of being selected, or you can't accurately determine what the probability of them being selected is. And what are some sampling methods examples? Um, I did put this in the notes section so that you can refer to it. A simple random, select, simple random sample um, is where you randomly select, you randomly select several numbers, and um, your population already has a number assigned to it. So it's basically like you're rolling a very large dice, and um, 
you, you have these numbers and then they correspond with the numbers in whatever your population is. And that's also the same with random digit dialing. Um, systematic sampling is where you um, go every so many, you have a list and you go every so many um, um, persons. So every, and I'll give you an example here, you um, randomly select a number, you start with that one down the list, so your number that you randomly selected was 20, and then you go every 50th person or every 75th person or every 10th person down a list that you have, and that's a systematic way. Stratified is where you know um, a characteristic about your population. In other words, you know what percentage of your city are, um, have library cards. So let's say that 60% of your um, city residents have library cards. You would randomly select 60% to be um, users and 40% to be non-users, and you would do that in a random way. Um, Non-probability convenience sampling, that's where um, you grab anybody you can <laughs> and it like it says it's a convenient it's a convenience it um, it's perhaps easier to do uh, you might have better chance of getting respondents uh, judgment sampling um, for example if um, you were at Walmart and you decided to randomly sample uh, or not randomly um, you decided to sample the people at Walmart to give them a survey you might only select the people that you know <laughs> that would be a judgment sample Quota sampling is again where you're going for proportions, but you do not you use judgment or convenience to select them and get them into your categories of user or non-user, so you, they're not randomly selected. And snowball sampling can also be a very effective way, uh, especially when you're going for a, you're talking about a population that is very hard to reach. So um, let's say, for example, that you would like to survey Hispanics in your um, population and you only know a few, well, you survey them and then you ask them to recommend people that they know. That's what's called, a, it's done by referral. So the first example of sampling that I have for you is a simple random sample. Your population is all your patrons. Your frame, sampling frame, is your patron database. And the method is random number generator. Um, so because you are able to assign, let's say that you have 400 patrons, you're able to assign them a number 1 through 400. And in Excel, I'm going to pull this up real quick. Let's say that you're going to sample 100. One and, four, uh, one and 100. And, and you have um, 400 patrons. That's right. Here we go. So um, it randomly gave you a number between 1 and, and 4, 1 and 400, I'm sorry, 1 and 400. Here we go. I hope I haven't confused you. We're looking for random numbers, 100 numbers between the numbers 1 and 400. And so um, you're going to select 100 numbers out of 400. because each of your patrons have been, has been assigned. You can either copy and paste down to 100 or use control D. Um, and then, so you can see there's 7, 172, 188, 88, and that is the number that's assigned to your patrons. And then you need to uh, paste special and do values so that it doesn't keep transposing because every time you copy and paste. Okay, and then you are able to sort from smallest to largest to make it easy for you. So patron number six, patron number seven, eight, nine, and then you skip to 34. And this is how you select out of 400, this is how you select 100 of your patrons. Um, sorry. Let's see, okay. Example number two is systematic. Um, the population that you're looking at are city residents that have a li listed landline telephone. Um, your frame is your telephone directory. And <laughs> this is very time consuming. You randomly select a number. The number you select that comes up is 20, for example, um, or smaller, for example, and because you're going to be selecting every 20th. And then you start there on the first page. So the number that came up randomly was six. And so you start there on the first page of the directory. 
you select the sixth person, and then every 20th after that. This is systematic. Now, um, you might come up with a business or some other number um, every 20th, and you just have to be systematic in how you would decide. Do you go to the next one and then go from 20th from there, for example? That is a systematic way to, to select. And, you know, be as rigorous as you can. This cannot be scientific. Um, scientific happens with large corporations and in ivory white towers in academia, <laughs> not on the level that we're, we're talking about. We have a comment from the previous one you were doing with okay. the, um, Excel. just said, always forgot about that function. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> you, bet. you bet. You <laughs> bet. Yep, it's a very helpful way to get a ran random numbers. And a suggestion that there's also random number generators online that you might be able to find. A absolutely. Um, just um, Google random number generator, and there are several mm -hmm. that will come up. Mm -hmm. it, however, they may only give you the one number, and then you'd have to do that 100 times. Yeah. <laughs> so it might be easier Depends to do on what one. You're to do, yeah. Right, it might be easier to do it in Excel. Um, sampling number, sampling example number three. This is a convenient sample. Um, you are looking at all the people that walk through the front door of your library, and anyone who approaches or passes by the desk is your sampling frame. And what's your method? You stop as many people as possible or you, um, people that are in your area on the hour every hour for three days, something like that. Um, as long as you're, now, here's where you might be put in some judgment. You might see somebody come in and um, you know that they're a talker <laughs> and you don't want to survey them because you know that they're going to take half an hour to complete your survey when you know it should only take three minutes. That's where, that's a, for example, of judgment sampling where you decide not to ask them. <laughs> The more rigorous you can be, the better. So t please keep that in mind. Um, another convenience sample would be utilities. Utilities are somewhat are sometimes very helpful um, with libraries. You could ask to include uh, uh, a survey in the um, in the um, utility bill, and that's another example of, of a way to sample. You're going for everybody who lives, who receives, who has a utility bill, and um, that's how you uh, that's how you sample them. One example of a population is we talked about it's the entire universe, and so one population. Let's say you have a hundred people that attend an event, and while they're there, you hand out a survey to every single one of them, and while they're there, you ask them to fill out this questionnaire to provide feedback, for example, about that program, or perhaps you'd like to ask them other questions about um, library use um, and non and and their perceptions of the library. And there is where if if you had a hundred people attend and you handed out a hundred surveys, you're going for the entire population. Convenient sampling would be that um, you hand out as many as you can uh, to everybody that walks through the door. So sample size criteria. I'm, I'm going to go over this very quickly because it is somewhat technical. Um, the level of precision or your sampling error, um, it's, it's going to be hard because of how much you know about your population. But um, I do have a question okay. about the universe sample. Sure. But what return rate should you get on that? Well, um, your return rate might actually be a little bit better than if you were to actually sample because you have a captive audience. That's true. If you're conducting, <laughs> you try and encourage them, please, right. everyone, fill this out. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And if you were doing a focus group, for example, um, and you were doing 10 focus groups, and you had eight people in your 10 focus groups, that's 80 people, mm -hmm. you have sampled people to participate in your focus groups, but your population is your focus group attendees. And then you would have a much better chance of having everybody um, complete the survey because you have a captive audience. So you, you, I would expect that your return rate, uh, as long as you have a pen for every person <laughs> to complete the survey, you might get 80%. You might mm -hmm. get 90%. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you, know, you want to make the survey short, you don't want there to be um, reasons for them not to want to com complete the survey. But if you keep it short and sweet um, and, they can, and they can fill it out right when they're there and hand it back in right when they're there, you should get a pretty good return. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a little clarification to that. What point does it become accurate in terms of return rate is what I meant to ask. I don't know what you I'm not sure accurate. what you mean by accurate. Accurate in terms of what? 
Oh, okay. Well, we're going to talk about that in just a second. We'll talk about sample size, and that yeah. might answer your question. In terms and if of that, results. Uh, yeah. And if that mm -hmm. doesn't answer your question, we'll get to sample size in just a second. And I hope that will clear some things up. So um, when you hear um, CNN has done a poll or Gallup has done a poll, and especially when it comes around to elections, and um, people are saying they're going to vote for a certain candidate, and 45% say they're going to vote for um, candidate Smith, and 55% um, percent say that they're going to vote for candidate um, Johnson, but um, they've estimated what their um, sampling error is going to be if it's, um, I said 45 and 55. If it's plus or minus 5%, that actually means that um, the 45% who said they would vote for candidate Smith is actually 40 to 50%, plus, plus 5% on one side and minus 5% on the other side. 55% said they were going to vote for candidate Johnson, plus or minus 5% brings it down to 50% or up to 60%. Um, and so you see there's an overlap. You end up having 50% possibly saying they'll vote for candidate Smith, 50% saying they'll vote for candidate Johnson. Now Gallup conducted a, a survey um, in uh, the 20th century of um, presidents, uh, presidential candidates. And they ended up doing having a sampling error. Um, they predicted, I think it was, that Wendell Wilkie would win. But um, they had a problem because they weren't able to um, uh, survey people who didn't have landline telephones. And they ended up voting mm. for his um, opponent. I think it was Wendell Wilkie. So um, their sampling error was quite large, and they did not predict the, the, the candidate that won. Confidence level is if you were to take um, infinite number of samples, if you were to take an infinite number of samples, um, they would become normally distributed and they would all start to kind of um, hover around the true mean. And then degree of variability, um, again, if you are trying to sample um, users and non-users, for example, in your population, if you're trying to um, sample from your entire city residents, um, they might have two completely different profiles, and you would want to go with a larger um, number of people so that because you have subsets within your population, you have users and you have non-users. Or, for example, if you're going to um, try to get responses from Caucasians, Vietnamese, and Hispanics, there are um, large cultural differences, perhaps, between these uh, three races, and so... Um, you might want to go for a larger sample size, especially of the Hispanics and the Vietnamese, so that um, you get a, a better representation of how they truly think as a group. Determining the sample size. Now, I got this off of the, inter off of the Internet. Um, my survey research, some of my classes, I'm a little bit rusty. Um, but if you're, we were talking about confidence levels, um, these, are just, these are just suggestions. Um, so if your city is a population of 500, to have a confidence of plus or minus 5% on your responses, in other words, satisfaction with um, library services, plus or minus 5% to, to see what your range is, you would want to sample 222 people. That, um, if, if your population is 100, and you only sample 10 people, you only have 10 responses, you're going to want to go for a higher sample size. Actually, you want to try to get for 100 um, respondents because you will get a better representation of what people truly think. Um, Gallup, when they do nationwide polls, they sample 1,000. Um, past, past that, there's uh, d diminishing returns. So um, as you can see, even with a population of 100,000. So now you um, implement the sampling plan. Um, here's where I stop and recommend that if you live in a larger city and you're trying to um, do a fair, or even, you know, if you're trying to do a, a rather rigorous um, survey, you might consult with your local college, psychology or sociology department. And they may be, maybe they do consulting in town and they may be able to help you implement a sampling plan. They may even help you do um, a survey from start to finish. Um, typically, psychology and um, sociology departments, the professors have um, conducted surveys in the past, and um, so that, that would be uh, one way where you could um, 
look into conducting a survey and getting a good sample. Um, so this is where, if you're doing a systematic, you pull out that phone book or you pull out that state directory, you um, get your random number, you go every um, so many entries, you pick out the names, and this is the implementing the sampling plan is the selection of your sample. Um, at the end, you evaluate your sample. Uh, you want to look at your response rate. Um, once again, if you um, sample only 20 people and you get a 50% response rate, that's only 10 people. If you um, sample 100 people and you get a 50% rate of response, response rate, that's 50 people. As you can see, you're going to glean more information from 50 people than you are from 10. And um, Typically, when you do a mail-out survey, um, you can expect between 30 and 60%, 30 and 60%, give or take. Um, if you do a telephone survey, um, you're contacting them directly, and you could expect a higher, a higher return. Um, I wanted to go back on samples. Um, it is difficult to um, do telephone surveys anymore, and Gallup has run into problems with this. CNN has run into problems with this because everybody's going to cell phones. And even though their numbers are randomly, um, randomly selected, if they're not including um, cell phone prefixes, they're not going to catch that population, which means that you're, or that sample, which means you're going to be probably leaving out people who are more technologically savvy, have a higher level of income so that they can um, afford a cell phone and possibly be younger. So you're going to, you're going to miss a whole uh, subset of people if you go with a telephone survey and just go out of your telephone directory. Um, that's, that doesn't have anything to do, well, it kind of, no, that doesn't have anything to do with response rate, but I did want to throw that in there. Okay, we're done with sampling. Any mm -hmm. questions? Um, nothing new has come up. Okay. All right. That was the quick and dirty, and I wanted to get it done in half an hour, and we made it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to talk about survey methods just a little bit. Now, the pros and cons, I discussed the pros and cons of um, the different survey methods in um, the first of this three-part series, and so I'm not going to talk very much about it um, because um, I go into greater detail in the previous session, and we don't have a lot of time. Um, but there are um, different survey methods that we're, a couple, we're going to concentrate on um, three survey methods um, today, but I just want to talk about these a little bit. Um, survey method number one is mail or paper and pencil. Um, so you print out a survey. It becomes your, it, that's your questionnaire, that's your tool, and you either mail it out or perhaps you hand it out or um, it's, um, it's um, distributed and people themselves actually um, actually fill it out themselves. Uh, group administered, for example, if you're at a program and you hand it out to the people in your program or you're conducting uh, focus groups, you hand it out to the group that happens to be present. Um, there's internet surveys and I will go over um, some sort resources for you to conduct internet surveys. In other words, people go to a website and they take the survey online. Um, there are also ways for you to do it by email. In other words, you um, send the, um, the survey out either in the body of the email or as an attachment, at which point, but mostly email is where they email you back and they put X's in front of um, their responses. And then there's interview. In other words, um, you have the paper and pencil and um, you stand there and you ask the questions and you complete the responses for them. So people who come by the desk, you say, could I ask you just five quick questions? We're conducting a survey. You ask the question aloud, you give them the response, you give them the response categories, they respond, you check it off. Um, same with telephone, you call people up, could I ask you uh, five questions about our library, blah, blah, blah and um, you give them the question and the response categories, they respond, and you, you um, collect the data. You write it down. That was quick. Okay. Um, real quick, um, targeting your respondents, how are you, going to, um, how are you going to recruit your respondents? You might be doing this before you even send out the survey. You might send out a letter saying, um, Happy Place Library is um, gearing up um, for... Uh, we're, we're talking about the possibility of constructing a new library. We are going to be sending out a survey or 
um, we will be emailing out a survey or we would like you to consider coming to this website and, and um, participating in this survey. You could send out an email blast. You could post it on your website um, with the link to the survey. You might send it out in a newsletter or perhaps you would um, give a press release saying that this is going to be, this is going to be conducted. Any questions? Nope. Okay, nope. we're moving on. So um, we talked about the method of administration, paper and pencil, which is um, self-report. Um, if, if they fill it out themselves face-to-face, -face, where you ask the questions and you fill it out, or telephone, where you ask the questions and you fill it out. There's the electronic um, kind, where um, you send out an email and they respond in the body of the email. Or you have the, the you could ha have the um, survey attached as a Word document or PDF, and they either complete it as a form online and email it back to you, or they print it out, use their pencil and complete it and return it to you in some way. And then there's the online or internet um, survey method. And the pros and cons, just a little bit about that. Um, paper and pencil is fairly inexpensive. Uh, if you do self-report or face-to-face, -face, if you do telephone, that's a lot of man hours and um, it's quite detailed. Um, electronic, once again, that's very fast. You're, t you're going to probably get a better, um, you might get a better response rate and much more quickly than if you were to do paper and pencil, mail it out and ask them to mail it back. Um, online and internet, once again, you would probably get a faster return rate. It's very inexpensive, but depending on how you recruit your respondents, you may not get a very good response rate. Okay, um, paper and pencil, we're gonna get to it here. Um, this is again self-report, face-to-face, or telephone, and um, I'm going to um, walk you through how to format a paper and pencil survey real quickly. I hope this is what you are expecting from this. Mm -hmm. If you're wanting the question bank again and um, how to conduct or how to construct response categories and the types of questions that you can ask, that is in session one. Okay, so um, you have everything that you want to include in your survey, including your questions, your response categories, your introduction. Um, I don't have the, the last, yes, I have the last part on here. Okay. Um, I hope this is large enough for everyone to see. Okay. Um, so you have the title of your survey. You're going to make that in bold and big. Um, your font size for the rest, you want it to be printed out and take a look at it. You don't want it to be so tiny that they can't read it. So I recommend a 12, 12 point font is a pretty good size. Here's your introduction. Happy Place Public Library would like to find out where we are now. You want to put that first to kind of put things into context. Um, let them know their responses are confidential if they're going to just be um, handed in and not adding um, their name and even if they add their name that you're not going to be using their name um, attached to their responses without their express uh, permission. Okay, so that is your, um, that is your uh, introduction. And then you have your questions and you, you put your response categories underneath. Um, we'll number them at the end, but um, your question, you're going to bold them so that that's what shows up. You have your response categories. Um, I recommend inserting a square of some sort, um, a checkbox. If you go to Wingdings, there's a really nice checkbox that you can use. It's got a little shadow, and it shows them that that's the one that they would X or um, fill in. And then I do a little space to kind of give it um, to show, to set it off a little bit. So you would go through each and every one of these, copy, paste, copy, paste, oops, in the right spot. Um, you might also consider your line spacing. Um, you might space it out just a little bit. To make it a little bit easier to read, you see how it, um, the space helps a little bit? Spreads it out a little, makes it a little easier. It does. Eyes. It yeah. does. It really does. Um, now, notice here, there's a skip pattern. Um, if you're going to be asking about library services and they've never visited the library, you need to give them directions. 
you need to let them know that the next few questions don't pertain to them. Um, and so I would put that in italics because it's a directional, um, it's, it's a directional entry. And so you would tell them what number to skip to. We'll put the numbers in last. Um, and then here again, you bold the question itself, and then you italicize, check all that apply, because that's not part of the question. It's, it's a, a direction. It's a, um, telling them how, how to respond. Again, there are check marks here for them to do. If there's another category, allow them to check it, and then they can fill in. If they don't recall, you might be able to give, you might want to give them an out. Um, this is also where um, you might do a skip pattern if they don't recall and then they can't um, recall their last visit or what happened with their last visit. Um, bold. And so on and so on. Now, this next question is a matrix. Um, you have your five response categories and you're asking about uh, several dimensions of their satisfaction with the variety of following items. This is where if you have five categories and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whoops, I stopped counting, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine um, dimensions. So our um, table is going to be six by ten. I'm going to have to add a few. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going too fast and you've never, um, if, if you're not real comfortable um, working in Word and you still have some questions about how to do this, you can contact me later. You can watch the recording and put it on pause. <laughs> yes, I'll watch the recording <laughs> and put it on clicking, pause. Yeah. <laughs> so your response categories go along the top, very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, neither satisfied nor dissatisfied, somewhat dissatisfied, very dissatisfied, goes in the fifth one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I only need ten. I'm going to delete a row. I have my dimensions, and I need to bold my question, oops. That did not work. There we go. That worked. Is anybody dizzy yet? Okay. So, um, nobody's logged out. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there with me. I'm doing a cell alignment centered and down at the bottom to make it look pretty. I'm going to make these a little bit smaller. And then I'm going to make the columns a little bit more narrow because what you're really concentrating on are the dimensions. And you want to make sure it's easy to read. And then you take your columns and you distribute columns evenly. There we go. Something like that. And then they've got their where they can check on each dimension. They're very satisfied about the fiction books. They are somewhat satisfied about the nonfiction, etc. And so there is your matrix. Now um, down below, if you want to give them a chance to comment, make sure it's close enough to the question so that um, they know that this relates to the question from above. Um, select your how many space how how deep you want your box to be, your text box. And then right here is borders. And do an outside border. And there you have a space for them to leave their comments. So you might even say comments about the variety or something of these items. OK, next is a transitional a transitional, you might want to leave some space or you might be on the next page, you know, so you're, you're making a transition. Here is your question, you bold it, 
And then once again, you're doing, you're inserting a sim, your symbol. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here again, um, if you want to do comments about the library website, this is a border. Um, another transition. Now, um, if you had a, here's where we're going to go up and we're going to um, number the questions. It's always a good idea to number your questions. Um, if you need to move your margin so it looks good, these you may want to move in then. This is, can be time consuming, but you want it to look good. Um, so that's how you would, that's how you would format the numbering. This is how I do it. If <laughs> if somebody has a better way, I'd say go for it. <laughs> Let me see. I guess I um, did that incorrectly. Oh, they want me to move that in. There we go. Leave um, plenty of white space. You may number. You might want to number your pages. You don't want your survey to be too long. Um, if you're turning the page, if it's on the front and the back, you want to put over at the bottom of the page. For example. Um, I would put it over to the right in italics, right justified, for example. You may want to number your pages. Um, if it's going to be more than one page, one piece of paper, be sure they're stapled or use um, eight, uh, eight and a half by, um, oops, 11 by 17 and something that you can fold into a um, now, don't forget, the longer your survey, the more survey fatigue, the less likely people might be to complete it. If you can do it on a half sheet and hand it out at the desk and have them complete it right there, just five questions, you might have a better response rate. It's a convenient sample, but there you go. Okay, that is the paper and pencil. Um, I just want to show you, if you're doing a telephone survey, you need to give directions to your interviewer. So, um, you give them your script. My name's Jane Smith, blah, 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 blah. And then they say your responses will remain confidential. May I continue? And if they say yes, you check. And then you tell in, um, I would use all caps to give directions to your interviewer to continue or no, terminate. Say thank you very much for your time. So then in number your questions. And then this is where they check off. Your interviewer does the checking off. Or if you're doing face-to-face, -face, if you're going to ask the questions at the desk, um, so um, here, for example, do you have a library card? You don't give them the um, don't give them the response. They'll either say yes or no, or they might say don't know. This is for the interviewer. It's in it's in um, it, uh, parentheses because you're not going to give that as a category. Um, here is a skip pattern, and you help you try to try to make it easy for your interviewer. Um, I'm going to read from a list of reasons why people might visit the library. So you want to put your, um, your question into context. If you recall, what was the purpose of your most recent visit to the library? You may include today's visit. Was it to use the computer lab, the yes or no, browse books? And if they get to the point where they're like, you know, I don't remember the reason why I was here, there is a, um, there is a place for you to check don't recall. Okay, so that's a telephone, that's a telephone survey. We're going to go to Survey Monkey here in just a second, but I do want to talk about um, a few other. Where do you go from current slide? Okay, um, these are some, and it's not an exhaustive list, but it's the ones that I could find of free. Some of them um, do have subscriptions, but I think some of these have limp. They give you limited features, but they're free. Survey Monkey, Zoomerang, free online surveys, Poll Daddy, Lime Survey, Survey Gizmo, and and Twitter Survey. Um, the one that I'm most familiar with is Survey Monkey. Some of them they will um, give you let you have one free survey, or they'll let you have unlimited um, free surveys, but they only allow 100 responses. Um, or they are they give you limited options for how you can format it or um, analyze your information. Okay, so we're doing the walkthrough. Here we are. Okay, we're going to go to Survey Monkey. 
If you have a Google account, um, it's easy to create your account. If you don't have a Google account, you just follow the instructions. Okay, I'm going to be skipping back and forth, sorry, between Word and um, SurveyMonkey. Um, let me see here. Okay, so you create a survey, and you name your survey Customer Satisfaction 2010, something to that effect. You can use survey templates. I haven't really looked at all of this, and this is what you get. Um, and along the left, be sure you kind of scroll through everything just to kind of see what's going on. This is where you go into, the, this is the tab for your designing your survey. Later on, you collect your responses and analyze your results. And I'll show you how you collect your responses in just a second. Analyzing results, that's part three of the three-part session. <laughs> okay, so my survey's already started one. Yeah, we do have a comment that somebody okay. just says that they love SurveyMonkey. They have a pro account and use it all the time. <laughs> Absolutely. It's quick. It's easy to use. Mm -hmm. um, we use it all the time here at the commission, too. We yeah. sure do. And, for example, I'm going to ask for your feedback at the end of the session, and I'll be sending you a link to my survey, and it is in SurveyMonkey. So you'll actually get to see how it works. Um, I've already done the, the first one here. Um, let me see if I can... So if you're going to do an, an intro, but, um, you can name your sections, but I decided I decide not to name my sections, so don't number your pages, but go ahead and number your questions. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do um, is um, an introduction, and that's descriptive text. And um, this is, um, we're doing the survey. We'd like you to share your information. Your responses are going to remain confidential. You can change your question size and the placement, in the size of your font and how wide it is, et cetera, et cetera. Play around. Be inquisitive. Be curious. Okay. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add a question afterward. And the type of question that we're going to ask Overall, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with the services the library provides to the community? And you have five response categories, so you're going to give them a multiple choice where they can only answer, they can only give one answer. In here, you put your question, and for some reason it copied my number. Don't worry about that because they're automatically numbered. And then your responses are here. And the checkboxes are in there, so we're going to have to get rid of those. Um, you can randomize your choices, um, unless you're doing a thousand people and you're talking about um, satisfaction with services and you want fiction, nonfiction, computer lab, and all these things to come up randomly. Um, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, you're going to, for this one, um, you don't. You can do a comment field. We'll go to get to one right, right quick here, where you ask them if they want to um, leave a comment regarding that one question. Um, you can require them to answer the question. They can't proceed unless they do. Um, that can be frustrating for people. So I would leave everything optional if possible. So here it is overall, and then you can see there are these radio buttons, and they have to choose just one. Add your next question. Um, you can't do skip patterns with a free SurveyMonkey. You can do skip patterns if you have a subscription. So, for example, this one, you're asking them to skip to a certain question. If you do that in your survey and you ask them to skip to question number six, um, yeah, know, know what question is number six. So, <laughs> But, but that might be a bit difficult for them to scroll down the page and skip to a certain question, and they may end up answering the questions in the middle in between question number three and question number six anyway. Okay, here's this one. If you recall, what was the, most, what was the purpose of your most recent visit to the library? Um, you can include today's visit. Check all that apply. This is 
matrix of choices, only one answer per row. No, I'm sorry. This is also um, multiple choice, multiple answers. Sorry about that. I hope I'm not confusing you. This is one where you can check all that applies, so multiple answers. Okay, here's where there's an other. Let me show you how to do other where they can fill in. Okay. Take that one out there. What? Let me see how this turns out. There we go. So they can check multiple, multiple of these. Um, edit the question. Let's see if we can do room for them to do a comment. Add comment field. Yes, other please specify. And so make the comment field an answer choice. Let's see how that looks. Ah, there it is. So other, and then they type in that they were there to make copies. Okay, the next one that I want to show you is this matrix. How satisfied or dissatisfied are you with these several dimensions on a five-point scale? And that one um, is um, I think it's matrix of choices. Here's your question. Here's the row choices. These right here. So your dimensions, and then your column choices are your very dissatisfied, very satisfied through very dissatisfied. What I like about SurveyMonkey is everything's really clean and looks looks very professional. And people mm -hmm. do SurveyMonkey so often that they're actually just getting used to the look of it. Um, and then if you want to add a comment field, so um, just say something like please comment. And you can change the size of your text box and if you want multiple paragraph of text, three lines big. So now it looks just like mine um, did. And um, you've got your categories across the top and you have, and what's nice, you see how they, um, every line is, um, every other line is colored, so it helps them separate that out. You can do that also in Word if you want to um, use a gradient and do every other line in, in a really light gray, something that's still easy to read if you print it out. Um, and then in this one, you can make the, the dimensions take up more space and this take up less space if you have really long um, responses. Let me see. I have one like that. Here we go. The library provides valuable service. Here we go. To what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statements? This is a matrix again. Your row choices are these sentences, and they're supposed to um, agree on a scale. So there are your, um, your um, dimensions. Here are your responses, your response categories. And then down here, um, you can change your question size and placement. So you want your first column, they call it a label. Perhaps you want that to be bigger, take up um, more space because you've got a very lengthy response um, dimension. So if you can see above here, this only takes up one-sixth across. This takes up 40%. And then this leaves room here on the right. So um, that's how you could do that. 
Okay. That is Survey Monkey. Um, Zoomerang is probably similar. Um, Poll Daddy is probably similar. Um, Twit Poll now has a Twit Survey. Twitter, I should say, not Twit. <laughs> it's TWT, sorry. Twitter has um, a poll and also has a survey option. Um, so you can follow the links from, from here. Um, Someone did have a question about the Survey Monkey one, and I didn't notice where it was. So it's in that, what, <clears throat> what was text validation in the text box? There's something about text oh, validation. Oh, sure. If you're asking for a telephone number, they have to do it in the format that you're asking. Uh, so, um, or they have to put in a response. Let me see here. Let's go back to one that we already have done. See what is tech validation? Okay. Oh, there it is. So it has to be a specific length. It has to be a whole number. It must be a date in this in this um, format or an email address. If you're asking for the email address, basically they'll validate it for you that um, it has to have an at symbol in it or something to that effect. I'm not sure exactly how that works. But play around, have fun. That's Survey Monkey. We do have someone else who said that they wish they'd seen this webinar when they were learning Survey Monkey. Uh huh. That you you're bet. doing a very good job of going through it all. Oh well, thank <laughs> you very much. Um, I had to play around, and mm -hmm. um, you know what? You can't mess it up. This isn't going live. Um, no, not yet. Yeah. And um, one other thing about Survey Monkey to collect your responses, you've done the design. You go in here to collect your responses. Um, you can ask them to um, create a link for you. which you would then um, post everywhere <laughs> to try to get people to go to that. Um, it's a website address. It's a web address, and it's unique to yours. So here it is, for example, my new survey has this. Um, you can um, also, if you um, have a, um, if you subscribe to it, you can actually put behind here Happy Place Library or something like that instead of HQD6 something five five. I feel like I just took an eye exam. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the screen's far, we've got this on the big screen and I'm just trying to read it from where I'm sitting. All right, um, that is uh, online surveys, the one that I was wanting to show you. We do have uh, comments about online surveys in general too, but mm -hmm. someone mentions that Google Forms is a quick and dirty way to put out a survey too. Um, you get your own um, responses automatically in a Google spreadsheet, which is great. Um, and gives you an embed code to put the survey on any web page, but it's definitely not as much functionality and ability to build in logic like with SurveyMonkey. So awesome! It's something, but not as complex as the SurveyMonkey. Well, thank you, Google Forms. Google Forms. I've taken note of that, and I will take a look at that. And I appreciate the feedback. Mm -hmm. um, again, this wasn't an exhaustive list, so I, oh, I no, certainly sure there's lots of stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> I certainly appreciate that. And if it's free, you know what? Go for it. Mm -hmm. Take a look at it, um, dig around, and um, see what you can get out of it. Um, thanks for, for telling us what the benefits are of them, too. Appreciate that. So here are some um, resources for you to look at in terms of sampling. If I went over it and you're more in if you're interested to um, look into sampling a little bit further, um, also there are some good blogs out there that talk about um, conducting surveys and how that can help your nonprofit. Um, we even have one of our very own that talks about engaging your users with polls, and in that, um, mm -hmm. Susan nicely um, she reviews several, several such as Poll Daddy, I think, and um, twi Twitter poll. Twitter poll, one, yeah. uh, Twitter poll. So, what's your next step? Well, your next step is to have courage. <laughs> Get out there, um, try this. Um, I recommend that before you conduct, if you're going to conduct a survey, go back and. Um, view the first of these three presentations and maybe stick around in the month and view the third of these presentations so that you have an overview of the entire survey process. Um, but if you want to start thinking about your sampling plan, if you're already um, in the, the midst of planning your survey and um, you've got a pretty good handle, you feel, on um, what's going on and you, you need to think about um, how you're going to sample and then um, in what format or method you're going to conduct your survey, what kind of questionnaire you're going to use. Um, I hope that I've been of help to you today and that you can take heart and move forward. Um, are there any other questions? Um, 
nothing about surveying that um, stuff we'll get to in a second. Yeah. Okay. And so here are some related topics. Again, there's the conducting surveys part one, the introduction and questionnaire design. That's where the question bank uh, comes in, and um, we talk about um, response categories, pros and cons of what kind of uh, how to conduct a um, survey, and then. Um, John Felton here at the Library Commission also um, uh, gave a very good uh, Encompass Live session on presenting data in meaningful and interesting ways, and I will also cover that in my third session of this three-part series. And then there's American Fact Finder, Mining the U.S. Census for information about your community. That's if um, you're um, trying to get a context for how you are going to conduct your survey. That's also very good. I think that was with Get Beth Goble. I'm not sure who did that one. Yes, I believe it was. Okay. She's in our government documents department here, yeah. And upcoming sessions here at the commission, um, Michael Sowers does a tech talk about once a month, and those are always lots of fun. You glean some very interesting and um, helpful and useful information from those. Part three of this series will be coming up on July 14th. I hope to see you all there. <laughs> and uh, July 21st is another Encompass Live um, about communication and getting the word out. Um, once again, here are the uh, resources. I guess I had that um, slide twice. Just to reinforce, apparently. <laughs> and then uh, here we go. Here's my survey. Um, survey Monkey, I'd like you to complete my survey. Um, let me know how we did today, uh, what you learned, what more you'd like to know. If you have any questions for clarification, this is your opportunity. Um, I certainly appreciate the feedback and the help to make my presentations more effective. And also, it's one way for you to test drive a Survey Monkey survey and see how it works. And that is it and we did it in an hour <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm going to have a thanks great webinar to get me ready for my training needs assessment that they're working on excellent um yes and uh Catherine, so thank you very much for attending i think this is a great session definitely we're, we're really getting a lot of interest in this uh, series that we're doing so it's a big obviously people need to know what their patrons want and need you bet um Catherine already mentioned some of the things that will be coming up um there's, those are just some select sessions she has. If you go to our main page, it was shown on the present on the PowerPoint that I was showing originally. Um, next week, our Encompass Live will be One Book, One Lincoln, um, our One Book program here in Lincoln, um, where they're actually doing a new thing this year where the community gets to choose what the book will be. Um, community members always give um, recommendations, but actually, actually there's a voting now, um, so they have a choice of five. So that will be, we'll have people from Lincoln um, City Libraries next week for that, so hope you'll join us for that. Um, our sessions are recorded, and the PowerPoint presentation will be available when we put up the recording of today's session, so you'll have that. Um, also, someone asked about how long these sessions are archived. Um, as long as we can keep them up there. This, these are our sessions, our recordings. We have them going back to when we first started Encompass Live, January of 2009. So um, these sessions will be up there um, for a very long time. Unless they become outdated completely, we would never take them down. Um, so you should have no problem. Someone's saying they might not need to do this till next spring. No problem. Keep the link or come back and check, and you should be able to find the recordings for all of them. Um, and this is the session, the recording page for the first session. For anyone who's, see, well, I know people were looking for if they just if you just started with today's part two of this series, um, this is um, the first one, and we'll be sent all the links for all of this too. You bet. Yeah. Okay. I think that is it. We are all set. Um, we're just getting some thank yous. Great webinar. Oh, Thanks well, thank a lot. You. Thank you. It was my pleasure. <laughs> yep. Thank you very much for attending, and hopefully we'll see you uh, next week or next time for part three of this next month. Save the date, July 14th. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.